Hey, this is Rick with Let's Level Up, and today I wanted to talk to you guys about Lords of Waterdeep. It is a worker placement game from Wizards of the Coast, uh, based in the uh, Forgotten Realms Dungeons and Dragons campaign setting of Faerun, specifically in the city of Waterdeep. Uh, now, this is a game um, that plays two to five players and plays just as well with two as it does five. Um, this is a game, a great game for um, people who may be new to tabletop playing uh, type of games. Uh, worker placement games are generally fairly easy to understand, fairly easy to play. And so what we'll do in this video is show you how to play it. Hope you guys like it as much as I do. Game on. Lords of Waterdeep is a worker placement game, and what I mean by that is that each player is going to represent one of the several Lords of Waterdeep. Um, the Lords themselves are hidden throughout the land, so each player is secretly dealt a Lord's card at the start of the game. And these Lord's cards have a little bit of flavor on there. Uh, maybe even give you some opportunities to do some uh, neat role-playing type things. Uh, you know, it depends on what your gaming group is gonna uh, is made up of, or made up like rather. Um, primarily, every lord is gonna give you a bonus, uh, like Durin the Wanderer here. Uh, Durin says at the end of the game, you score four victory points for each commerce quest and each warfare quest you complete. Um, most of the lords in, this, in, the, in the core set here are going to be this exact same type of thing where they'll get four victory points for a type of quest and then a separate type of quest. Uh, the only one that's different is uh, Larissa, uh, sorry, Larissa here. And Larissa gets uh, four victory points for every building that she has bought throughout the game. So she's a, she plays a little bit different than the others. Um, so every player is going to be dealt one of these. Um, you'll look at it and kind of play the game based on that because you're going to want to get as many of these victory points as possible. Um, this game plays, again, worker placement. So uh, you'll be competing the game throughout eight rounds. And in that, um, you'll be trying to get as many victory points as possible. Uh, in order to win the game. Uh, you will also play one of the five factions. Um, and those factions are the City Guard, which are represented by the Black Pieces, uh, the Knights of the Shield, the Silver Stars, the Red Sashes, and my personal favorite, the Harpers. Now these basically is just a way for you to assign your color. You don't get any bonuses by choosing a specific um, a specific uh, uh, faction, so to speak. Um, this card itself is your uh, tavern. And the tavern represents basically your play area throughout the game. Uh, this middle section here is where you'll put your resources such as gold and different adventurers who are sitting in this tavern, uh, you know, waiting to be assigned. At the top, you'll have your agent pool, which is your available agents. Uh, this side, you'll have your list of active quests. Uh, right side, you'll have your list of completed plot quests. And then at the bottom here, um, you store um, your completed quest pile. And then underneath your card, you'll put your Lord of Waterdeep. Um, so again, this is kind of just a general player management, player mat uh, for the game. And the back side just has a nice logo of the typical of the faction itself. Now essentially from round to round what you're going to be doing is placing these meeples here which are going to be your agents. Uh, these meeples or your agents rather will be placed one at a time um, and after I place my agent the next player on the list or the next player around the table um, will place theirs and this will keep going until there are no more agents left to play in the round. 
Now there are certain cards you can play that allow you to increase your number of agents. Um, you can complete certain quests and get bonus agents and things like that. That again it keeps things nice and interesting. Uh, but essentially, uh, whenever all of these have been spent for every player, again, one at a time, uh, the round is over. After eight rounds, whoever has the most victory points wins. So, depending on the number of players you have, you'll collect your starting agents and then put them in your tavern here. Just in your active agent pool there at the top. Uh, you will also take as many of these uh, identifier tokens as you have. And this identifier is pretty simple, um, and essentially all it is is to help uh, figure out who owns which buildings um, that have been purchased from the Builder's Hall. Um, so, for instance, um, if I've bought a building, I would essentially place it on the game board and then have my token there in the corner of the building. Kind of like so. So then I can see that the Harpers clearly own this building. We'll get more into buildings and buying buildings here in a second. Also here, I will take my uh, victory count marker and I will place it at the starting zero spot on the board. Everybody will do this for their faction. And then I will be dealt a specific lord which I will then take and place at the underside of my player mat. When everything's said and done, my player mat will look something like that getting started. Now, Lords of Waterdeep's primary mechanic is going to be basically taking an agent on your turn and placing them at an assigned position here throughout. Uh, one key thing to remember is that once an agent has been assigned, no other player, including yourself, can assign an agent to that spot. So once a spot's filled, um, you're basically cut off from that for the rest of that round. Uh, so essentially on my turn, I would be trying to collect whatever resources I need in order to uh, successfully complete my quests to get more victory points and win the game. So for instance, if it's my turn and I have to have a wizard, um, I would basically take my agent and I would put it here at Blackstaff Tower, thus yielding me one wizard. And you can see when you look closely at the table at the city itself you have the name of the building and then whatever it yields is generally underneath it or to the side of it. Um, so every, all the kind of rules for placing your agents throughout the game are laid out for you. Uh, whoever is going to be starting the game uh, will take the castle icon here and just put it on their uh, tavern, letting everybody know that they're the starting player. Um, you can actually place an agent at Castle Waterdeep uh, to get the starting player position. So outside of the core mechanic of actually placing your agents uh, player by player for the round, uh, you're going to be uh, dealt, and when you begin the game, two quests. Now there are two different types, or actually there are three different types of quests. Um, there are your standard quests, and then you know, there are plot quests, and then there are mandatory quests. Uh, one thing to remember when you play this game is that you can only complete one quest per round. So it gives you a maximum of eight quests that you complete throughout the entire course of the game. Um, every quest has got a uh, theme here. You have the type of quest that it is, whether it's an uh, arcana quest, a piety quest, skullduggery, commerce, or even a fighting, like a warlord type quest. Um, you have, let me see if I can zoom in here really quick. Uh, you have the name of the quest, you have whatever requirements, and then whatever the reward is going to be after you complete a quest. Now I said there are three different types of quests. Uh, these are your general uh, normal quests. Once you complete them, they go into your tavern and your completed quests. Plot quests allow you to complete the quest, and then the plot quest yields a benefit for you um, throughout the game, kind of a passive ability that you would get for completing that type of quest. Plot quests are generally rare. Um, if you notice also 
here at the top where it says pay to your commerce, that's going to tie back to the lore that you've gotten. So as you play the game, um, if your uh, specific lore gives you bonuses for piety or commerce, uh, you're going to want to be trying to complete this quest as often as possible. There's also a type of quest called a mandatory quest, which is sort of an attack from another player. Uh, those are generally quests um, that give you very low uh, rewards and basically takes up your quest that you could take for the turn. Uh, so if you have this quest here uh, and I'm only one fighter away from completing this guy, someone plays a mandatory quest on me that gets rid of my wizard and my cleric and only gives me two points, I'm kind of stuck until the next turn trying to scramble for those resources. Um, those are called Intrigue cards, and we'll get into those here in a bit. Um, so you, at the beginning of the game, you're going to get two of these quests dealt to you. Uh, so you can see here an example of how I would set up my active quest next to my tavern. Um, these are public knowledge, and the only thing that's really going to be hidden from the other lords is who you are. Because again, all the lords of Waterdeep are secret to one another, or at least most of them are, as, as far as the lore goes. Now, once you've completed these two quests, or throughout the game, you can actually assign, uh, you can actually collect other quests. Um, there are certain buildings that can give you quests. Uh, the most common of these methods is going to be placing an agent in the Cliff Watch Harbor. Now, there are three different positions of Cliff Watch Harbor. Uh, basically, the left side, which yields a quest card, and that's your pick from any of these four turned up quests. And once you pick a quest from there, you immediately take the uh, next available quest and flip it over and replace it. Um, and also gives you two gold. Uh, the middle section gives you a quest card, again, your pick, and then an intrigue card as well. And then the last, you clear out all of these cards, draw four new ones, and then take your pick from that. So if you're playing the game and you're needing quests, or you can see all of those quests there, um, either are really helping one of your opponents or really hindering you because that's not what you need to do. You can actually clear all those out and then take your pick for the next drop. Again, uh, the whole key component here is I play an agent on that space. I will take whatever quest it is that I like and then get whatever additional reward, such as two gold, and put that in. So after we determine who's first player and collected all of our pieces and quests, um, you are going to actually get a set of starting gold pieces equal to your position in the table. Um, so whoever is the first player gets the lowest amount of gold starting out, and then the next player gets one more gold, and then so on and so forth. Uh, it's basically a handicap for them getting to go last. So uh, really this game's going to be about who places their units first, or sorry, their agents first, and what positions they place them in. Um, you can actually get into some pretty interesting table politics here with this game, which is one thing that I really like about it. Um, before you could start playing, you need to be dealt two, and these will be face down, but you'll be dealt two and three cards. When I'm dealt these two cards, I'll just put them somewhere on my playing area so that uh, nobody else can see them, but we'll all have access to them. And we'll get into how to play these here in a second. Um, there are three different types of Intrigue cards available. Um, the first of which are Utility cards. Util when you play a Utility card, keep in mind that this is something that's generally going to help you and possibly help another um, uh, player of your choice. Um, Utilities are not necessarily offensive. It's generally going to allow you to get certain resources that you may have been denied or may be really needing. Uh, a lot of times you'll see it, um, uh, you get your pick of any two uh, adventurers, and then you pick a player, and they can have a, their pick of an adventurer, or um, everybody has the ability to try to sell you one of their adventurers for a certain amount of gold, something like that. The next type, and what I was uh, leading to earlier in the quests, are mandatory quest adventure cards. Um, you could see here that it requires um, one warrior, one rogue, one wizard, and only gives you two. So when you take a look and you compare that against a reward of turning in this quest of 18 versus just two, you can see how these mandatory quests will really make a difference when it comes to actually playing this game. 
The last type of intrigue card is an attack card. This is generally something that will sabotage another player's resources. Now there are, uh, there is, however, a, an entire deck full of these things. Um, so these will be shuffled, and two will be dealt out to every player. After you've done this, you're ready to actually start playing the game. Okay, so again, in Lords of Waterdeep, it's going to break down to just a few very simple mechanics. First and foremost is going to be agent placement. Whoever has the first player is going to place their agent first. Keep in mind, you're trying to collect victory points in this game. And you can do that by completing quests or completing any bonus objectives you have. Um, also, um, you can get these tokens anywhere they are throughout the board if you place an agent on something that has one of these things. Uh, it looks sort of like a ruby. Um, these rubies uh, indicate um, victory points. Every one of those you pick up is a spot on the victory wheel. Um, when you get to turn five, you will get a bonus agent down here. So if you start out with two, you can eventually get three when it comes to turn five as they're getting more buildings out there and people are purchasing more things. Um, it makes it a little easier for you to move. Now, the Builder's Hall is a unique area, kind of like Cliff Watch Inn. Now, Cliff Watch Inn is pretty much tied to specifically getting quests. Uh, the Builder's Hall allows you to purchase buildings. And when you look at a building, I won't take one from the available list, I'll just take one from the stack. Uh, every building has a couple of different properties to it. In the top left corner, you're going to have the total cost of gold it's going to take. Uh, you'll have the name of the building. You'll have any um, uh, flavored, not necessarily flavored text, but the basic the rules of the building here. Uh, for instance, this is the golden horn, and when you purchase it at this end, the start of every round, you place four gold on this. And then when somebody assigns an agent to it, you take all the gold that's on the space. And the owner of these buildings also gets a perk, which will be designated down here. So the owner of this building, no matter who assigns an agent, will get two gold from this. Um, so how to actually purchase these buildings uh, is as simple as just assigning an agent to the Builder's Hall. Now you remember, once someone assigns an agent to the Builder's Hall, or sorry, an agent to a space, um, no one else can assign an agent there for the rest of that turn. So if I were to purchase a building from the Builder's Hall on turn one, no one else will be allowed to purchase here unless they have an Intrigue card that allows them to move things around um, and they can play that at that point. Um, again, like any other game, the card dictates the rules. Um, so the general rule of thumb is you can only place an agent one time. However, there are certain cards that let you uh, re-exhaust, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, bring agents back to your pool once they've already been deployed. Uh, so essentially, once I place a builder, uh, sorry, an agent in the builder's hall, I get my pick of whatever buildings that are here. Uh, these victory points here throughout the game will actually be put, there'll be three in here per stack. And every round, I'll put one of the three victory points on each of these. So certain, and then who, whenever you buy that, you'll take whatever victory points are on that building. So for instance, on turn one, I will have one victory point apiece. And let's say I were to go ahead and buy uh, the uh, three pearls. Uh, I would go ahead and take the victory point here, thus moving my piece up one. I will take this and assign it to an empty spot on the builders uh, on the game area. I will put my identifier there. I'm sorry, that's a little bit off camera. Let me just slide this down just a cinch. Um, there we go. So I'll place the building here. I'll replace it with the next building in the stack. Again, I've collected my one resource, and now I own that building. So that was my placing of an agent. I own this building that's out there now. And then the next turn would come around, uh, whenever turn two came around, I would exhaust all the resources on this marker and basically place another one. Um, so if you have a building that's been in the game throughout the entire game and no one's bought it, at the eighth and final turn, it'll have eight victory points there, which would be quite a significant um, uh, purchase. Now, Waterdeep Harbor, there are three spots for Waterdeep Harbor. A first position, a second position, and a third position. 
they all yield the same thing, which it allows you to play an intrigue card. So that means there are a total of three intrigue cards that can be played every turn. Uh, to play an intrigue card, you have to be able to assign an agent uh, to one of the spaces that are there. So if all spaces are filled up by different players, I can't play an intrigue card if I'm that fourth position trying to get there. Uh, all of them have been taken out. Another thing that's interesting about uh, uh, Waterdeep Harbor is that at the end of the round, you reassign any agent that's in Waterdeep Harbor beginning with first position. So I will actually be able to take him and move him maybe to uh, Aurora's Realm Shop. Um, or, just so you can see it, to Castle Waterdeep so I can actually pick up an entry card that I may have used and get first player back. Then the blue player will take their agent, since they're in the second position, and then reassign it. And then finally, the, the red player will be able to reassign his agent uh, to another spot. The rules for reassignment is that you cannot reassign, again, to a space that already has an agent, or back to Waterdeep Harbor. Uh, so you can't just consecutively play more uh, entry cards that you have. Now, if you take all three spots, you'll be able to assign all three of your agents. So it's possible that you have a clean sweep um, at the end of the turn. And if you've been collecting intrigue cards, then you can go through there, play three different intrigue cards and get the benefits of those. Uh, and sorry, whenever you actually place an agent on here, you play your intrigue card immediately and then yield whatever uh, text is on that card. And then at the end of the turn, after everyone has their agents, all agents have been assigned, you reassign these agents here. Now there are two different types of resources in this game. There are monetary resources that are represented in gold in either single values or the crescent shaped five gold piece. Uh, you can collect as many gold as you want throughout the game. At the end of the game, any unspent gold you have is halved. Um, so for instance, if I have 10 gold, I would have that down to five and I would get five victory points at the end of the game, uh, kind of just as a bonus. The other resources are going to be in the form of these wooden cubes. And these are the primary resource of the game. Um, these cubes represent adventurers. Uh, the orange here represents a warrior. Uh, the purple represents a wizard. The black a rogue. And then the white is a cleric. Now you see I have assigned an agent to the Grinning Lion Tavern. When I do that, it allows me to take... two rogues from the stash, and then I can actually put those in my tavern. Um, again, every turn I'm trying to complete these quests. So once I get those two rogues, I will satisfy my rogue requirement to complete this quest. Then I only need one cleric, two more warriors, a wizard, and four gold, and then I would get the reward of 18 victory points and two intrigue cards. So this is a very powerful quest. It's kind of a long quest. It's one of those ones that um, you don't necessarily want to let your opponents know that you're trying to complete this quest. Although if they're paying attention, it's going to be hard uh, because, again, they could see everything you got. And Wizards of the Coast have actually announced an expansion to this game that will add a lot of new things. So uh, Lords of Waterdeep is a great game, very easy to learn, very easy to teach. Uh, it's one that I've taught my son, who's three years old, actually just turned four, um, and my wife, who is not a gamer whatsoever. Um, very fun to game, a uh, very fun uh, game to have hit the table. I definitely recommend you buy it, and um, if you don't already have it. Um, if you do have it, I'd be interested in hearing, uh, you know, uh, you know what, what are some of your favorite uh, uh memories from playing this game. You ever had any of those cool aha or gotcha moments where you played a mandatory quest on somebody on the 8th turn and ended up beating them by one victory point? I have. It was pretty cool. Um, I hope this video you got something and you figured out how to play this game. Again, this game is not super hard to play. Um, if you liked it, please subscribe. I'll put a little subscribe button right here. Um, also, please uh, tell your friends, like it, thumbs up it, 
uh, follow uh, Let's Level Up on Twitter at Let's Level Up or Google Plus or Facebook. And again, uh, thank you so much for watching. It really means a lot. Have a great night and game on.